so now what? All right, I guess we should. Uh... <laughs> I hey, you, everybody! Uh, no, I... <laughs> hey, everybody! Welcome to the Anti Cycling live stream for today. Uh, we got Mike Felch with us, and I just recently learned that his username is "You Stay Ready," uh, which. Not what I read for a very, very long time. Uh, I was like, <laughs> why does USA Ready have a T and a Y in it? But it's fine. All right. So Mike's going to talk to us about password spraying and bypassing things. And here's the fun part today. Here's the part that's like, we, we don't live in a perfect world. This is a first world problem I'm about to have. Uh, the issue is that Mike, for some reason, has terrible internet. Like terrible, like 13 megabytes down, 0.3 up. Like Look, point it's a three up. it's a dial up modem. Give me a break. Yeah, <laughs> no, just, and well, I don't that's know a pretty good dial up modem. Then I don't know what <laughs> hackery thing that you're trying to do right now, where you're like, you can't attack me if I got no internet, bro. But like, we'll see what happens today. And so what's going to happen is Mike's going to go and he's going to show you things. He's going to share things, and it's going to look like it's buffering. It's not. It's just <laughs> Mike's internet. Uh, so hey, it's it's farm life, farm life, farm life. <laughs> All right. All right, Mike. So what do you got for us today? So thanks for having me. Um, and just to be clear, you stay ready. If you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. Yeah, that's um, true. That's, that's kind of where it came from. Anyway, um, I'm going to be showing a cool way to password spray Microsoft ADFS. A lot of people password spray other endpoints. Um, I like ADFS for lots of reasons. Um, one of which actually happened on this engagement that I just finished last week. Um, and so password spraying ADFS, blending in, hiding. A lot of people don't capture logs. Sometimes their federation isn't capturing um, the invalid logins. And um, and the only thing you really have to worry about is Microsoft blocking you based on IP address. So we're going to address that. And then um, there's a there's a freebie in there that I'll show you once we kind of get there. Um, but the cool thing with ADFS is, uh, you could also do username enumeration and, and whatnot. So I'm going to basically just kind of walk through some of that, how I do it. Um, I'm not actually going to do a password spray because obviously that'd be breaking the law. Um, but I will show you how to do it. Okay. Cool. And, uh, just as a, a Florida man to another Florida man to another Florida man, uh, all three of us have spent much, much time in Florida and, uh, I appreciate Florida man. Okay. Yes. All right. So go ahead and share your screen and Florida man and Florida man and Florida man are going to show you some hacking things. All right, cool. All right. You should see my Google screen. Um, so I've kind of preloaded some of this on here, but the first thing that we really need to do is we need to get the, um, the ADFS authentication page. So you can imagine office 365 or, um, some sort of Azure setup. Usually they have ADFS enabled, um, and so the goal is really just try to find that, right? So um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do this just kind of showing you Microsoft. Uh, so um, this is kind of where we go. So if you go to this login.microsoftonline.com slash get your user realm.srf and then pass in the login for whatever email address you want, but for the domain, right? And so our case, we're doing microsoft.com um, and you hit enter, you are going to get bunch of cool information. Now, this might take a second to load on my screen. So let me just talk about what you're looking at just in case you don't see it. The first thing you're going to notice is that in here, the namespace type says federated. So we know that Microsoft.com or Microsoft in general are using federated login. Um, and the other really interesting thing that we're going after here is this auth URL. So this auth URL is going to tell whatever application online is retrieving this information that, hey, if you want to log into Microsoft's ADFS, here's the authentication URL. So it's in this case, it's msft.sts.microsoft.com slash ADFS. Um, you'll probably start recognizing this forward slash ADFS forward slash LS um, in the URL. So uh, with that being said, um, we're just going to copy it and I'm just going to kind of show you what their ADFS page looks like whenever you would, if you would try to log into this. Um, so there it is. So I passed in username equals test at microsoft.com. You could pass in whatever you want. In this case, um, nothing too fancy, but this is the actual page that we're going to password spray here. So um, I'm going to hit the back arrow just so you can kind of see what, um, where we came from. 
but I'm going to jump ahead and I'm going to show you, this is what it would look like if you um, did not have a username. If you would have clicked that little arrow, brought it back to the login page, you could put whatever you want in here. Um, and then, but I wanted to bring attention to this, this um, ADFS slash LS slash uh, URI, because there's this other really cool un kind of, it's not really undocumented, but it's, it's, it's minimally covered anywhere. Um, if you're rolling in ADFS to your environment, a lot of times organizations create this special page. Uh, in 2012, it was by default, um, but it's an IDP initiated sign-on. So if you're familiar with like identity providers and relying party trusts, um, this is something interesting. This is where I'm actually spraying because a lot of times this is the perfect place to spray. Um, and it usually goes down. So on this last engagement that I was at, they didn't even see it. Um, the other thing, this IDP initiated sign-on page, which should be disabled if you find it, this Microsoft and other MSDN blogs and whatnot recommend that you disable this page or remove it. Um, Microsoft is available, so um, they're not following their own Kool-Aid, but that's neither here nor there. Um, this page is really interesting because if you click this sign into the one of the following sites, it's actually also, this is the freebie, an information leakage. So now you can see all of the really cool applications that are enabled in Microsoft's Azure environment for relying trust party uh, trust. So for being able to authenticate. So this is all like insider information that they're providing you externally. They don't mean it to be exposed. It is exposed. Someone could probably take this and report this to, for a bug bounty um, and probably do that. Um, I just about an hour ago and found that they were relaying or they were showing all the relying party trusts. It's probably eligible for bug bounty. I would report it. I'm not going to because I don't have time for that. Um, but you, you might be able to make some money by taking this page and disclosing it to them and saying, hey, you got an information disclosure. Your relying party trusts are displayed to all users from an unauthenticated perspective. Um, but anyway, normally I would write this up on an engagement on a pen test. So this is a useful finding. In our case, we don't really care. We're just going to click sign to this site and then click sign in. Now, this is something also interesting. Um, this is not normal. This is a custom IDP initiated sign-on page that Microsoft put together. Um, so evidently you can sign into any one of these number of accounts. Um, we don't really care about that. We're just gonna click on the first one, I guess. I don't know, Azure, we'll go back up. Actually, that's probably not the right one. Document expired. Looking for this other sign-on page. Maybe it's here, Microsoft account. It's gonna be one of these. Um, all right, cool, this, this should work anyway. Um, the idea behind this is, um, I'll come back. The idea behind this is we're going to intercept this in Burp, and then we are going to try and um, we're going to intercept it in Burp, but we're not going to actually spray it because obviously we would get hurt um, by the the Gov boys. Uh, but what I do is intercept it so you can see what I'm going to do, and then I'm also going to show you a quick way so that you could bypass Microsoft's IP restriction because Microsoft is going to blast you um, as soon as you send too many requests. It's going to block you, so we need to be able to get around that. Um, one other URL I'm going to share real quick just so you have it in case you need it later: login.microsoftonline.com forward slash common forward slash get credential type. Now it's going to just show some ADS error um, here, but um, if you do a post to this URL and use the username in like a JSON object, you could actually enumerate users in here and it'll tell you whether they're valid users or not. So let's just assume that we already had a good valid user set. I'm just posting it in here in case this is recorded or in case you're screenshotting me right now. Um, and so that's pretty much it, right? So what I'm gonna show you is a cool tool called Fireprox. Fireprox is a tool which will give you the ability to uh, create a AWS gateway for um, rotating your IP addresses for each web request. So if you do Python fire.py, I'm using a profile for my AWS configuration, so you could exclude that. But if you had your access keys already and it had it configured, you could do slash slash command list and it'll show you all your APIs that you have there. So what I wanna do is I wanna create an API, but I wanna point it at this right here. Because if I could point, point it at this and do create URL msft sts microsoft.com, what'll happen is AWS will create a proxy for you, give you a nice URL like, like so, this execute API, Amazon AWS, and any request, post or get, any parameters, any headers will actually be sent to the destination, which in our case was msft. Um, and all you have to do is hit your proxy IP address. Now, 
the real cool thing with this is when we do this, and I'm just going to show you what it looks like. Um, when you do this, it actually will rotate the IP address with every single web request. So you don't have to like worrying about spinning up means or anything like that. So it should load it here. It'll be kind of goofy because if it's loading like, yeah, see, it's loading CSS and HTML. And we didn't set up proxies for any of that. But you see the data here um, coming from Microsoft servers properly. Uh, and so all we would do here is we would intercept this URL uh, on Microsoft and then swap it out within Burp to come to ours. So let's do that real quick. Uh, and actually, before we do that, I'll show you what, I'll just test this. I have this little web server running here. Uh, and what it's going to do is it's going to post all of the um, the data to that URL. So let me show you kind of what I mean. So take this right here. I'm just going to do a quick curl. I am going to pass in a custom header here because I set this up so nobody would try to interact with my page and screw up my live demo. Um, curl, doo -doo -doo. I probably should use the URL. And proxy URL, which is right here. Copy that bad boy. So Firefox, I forgot part of the URL. So when, if you curl and you hit the API in my slow flipping computer, um, where's my web server? Here, I'll just hit it from my URL. How about that? It's on port 8080. That's the problem. So let's create another one real quick and point it at the right URL. So I'll just show you what this looks like. This should just echo things back here. Okay. So you see, I hit it. I hit the API. Now, obviously, this is going to send this to the Microsoft servers. But you notice that the IP address here is 1.12. You got 136.81. So every request that's coming through, the IP address is changing. Now, the only thing that you'll notice here is the host is actually forwarding the X forwarded four. Now this is the IP address of the originating, which was my IP address, so don't hack me, bro. But anyway, the X forwarded four IP address is here. Now the cool thing that I did with um, with Fireprox is you could pass in a custom header called X my X forwarded four, and you can set this to whatever you want. And then when it goes through, you'll see that it overwrites the X forwarded four. So you could act the X forwarded four. You could do all kinds of cool stuff with this. You can make this look completely different server or maybe the local host of whatever server you're hitting. And um, and so there's no real trace of your client IP address. The only thing that they could see is just some of the normal header stuff. And so if they wanted to block the header, um, then they could. Um, but if you look over here, you see all the requests coming through. And this is just printing them um, to the web server directly. Nothing um, spectacular, uh, but if we cancel that, if we curl this again, the empty reply from the server, oh, because I have to pass in my custom header. There we go. And then you'll see it's road address again. So uh, that's the cool thing we could do it. So basically what we would do here is we would click sign into the page. Now I have this burp thing here already going. So I'm gonna turn burp intercept on. Sign into the site. I'm going to put this baby through. Don't care about that. It should bring me to the page. Um, we're going to pass that through. I'll turn it off for a second just because I don't know. Let's see. Which one do we want to do here? We'll just, I got to find the right one. I don't know which one it is because of Microsoft's. Um, that's not the right one. It's one of these, but we're basically just going to intercept this. And then as we do this, it has to be one of these. One of these is going to be STS. It's going to be the last one. Yeah. That'd be but... fine. Yeah. Whichever the last one is. Always oh, is. It's always the last one. Yeah. Active Directory. I think my internet. You were doing really great up until now, Mike. I'm sorry. Super, super solid presentation. Partner. Let's try this again. 
Here, maybe we'll do. We will use this other one. I'm not saying everyone that's currently watching right now knows exactly how to fix this, but they're definitely not helping in the chat. I always like when stuff like this happens and so people who are go. watching are like, oh, other people make some mistakes yeah. too. Yeah. So we'll pass in test.microsoft.com. It'll bring us to the password page. Password. Now we're going to intercept here. This is where we do it. So we intercept it. Put whatever you want in here. Actually, we'll do summer 2022. We're not really going to do this. We're going to drop it. Uh, so ADFS, initiated sign-on. You'll notice if you scroll down, username, test at Microsoft.com, password summer 22. So if we take this and send this to Intruder, come over to Intruder, clear all of the cool stuff. We don't care about any of that up there. We're just going to change this. We're going to add one right here to test because that's all we're going to do is we're password spraying users. So we're adding one there. We're not even changing the summer 22. Uh, we're good with that. Now, the other thing that you need to do here though, is you do need to swap out the um, the URL for your proxy, right? Because you don't want to spray Microsoft servers. Otherwise, your Microsoft servers are not going to rotate the IP address. So there's the IP. Um, I do, this is how I, I take off Fireprox because you have to have Fireprox because it's part of the proxy. Put it here. So Fireprox, ADFS, LS, initiated I sign on. It's going to hit this URL. You want to make sure you update the host header to match the target. You change this. This is going to be your username list, your password. So we go to the next screen, which is the payloads. This is where you would load all your payloads. In this case, we're just going to say Bill Gates. And we're not really going to do this. We're going to stop it. Um, just nobody calls the law. We're going to turn off number of free trials on network failure because we don't want to lock out accounts. And then we click start attack, which I'm not going to do. What is going to happen if we did that? And I'm going to drop this because I don't want that to accidentally fly through. Drop, drop, drop. Okay, cool. All right, we did not break the law. Um, the request was dropped by user. You would see is you would see a pop-up window and it would enumerate all of the users with that one password that you have. And in the event where there's a successful password, you'll see a 200 and you'll see a really small number. You want to examine the results and you're going to see which ones you've actually found credentials for and you could log in. Uh, log in. The other really cool thing with this leaking the identity trusts is once you log in, you can click through these one by one and log into those account, these, these um, third-party relying trusts. Like I've seen Slack, I've seen Okta, I've seen all kinds of weird stuff. Like there's a LinkedIn Okta right here, Prod. Um, and so there's a test environment for Microsoft. So you can log into these environments and see what apps are there. I've seen everything from like CICD pipeline stuff from Jenkins. Um, I've seen some that have like 100 applications here. And it just really gives you the ability to quickly identify new attack surfaces, password spray without having to worry about your IP getting blocked or getting tracked back. Um, and, and the cool thing is it's also blending in. A lot of times they're not even logging anything. Um, this IDP initiated sign-on page in, in Microsoft Server 2012 R2 is on by default and you can't even turn it off. The only thing you could do is like hide this, this list um, using JavaScript. Um, on Windows Server 2016, it's disabled by default. But if they enabled it for testing their SSO configuration, then it's enabled again and there's no way to, uh, to turn it on um, to hide it. You'd have to basically disable it again. Um, so yeah, that's my presentation. It's a pretty cool one. I use it all the time and not a lot of people seem to know about it. I don't really see anybody talk about spraying ADFS very often. Um, so yeah, that's my story. That's all I got. What? You did that with a really terrible internet. So great job, Mike. Great Thank you. job. Uh, let's have you turn your video back on and we'll see if there's any questions here uh, to help answer. And the thing about like last week, Steve showed us uh, how to fish 0365 from like inside Microsoft. And, and the thing about Fireprox is I remember when you introduced Fireprox for the first time and, and, and the reason why I like Fireprox is because whenever I play backdoors and breaches with people, I always point out that that tool exists. And I'll ask everybody, I was like, hey, do you know what Fireprox does? And like, no one does, right? Because it's not like a widely used tool by defenders or anything. Can you give me like a real, just a one minute, one minute explanation of why you created Fireprox? 
Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, so the reason why I created Fireprox was I needed a quick way to rapidly rotate my IP address without being blocked, without spinning up lots of virtual servers and EC2 servers. And, um, and I needed to do that because I built it out of the need for password spraying Google. Um, Google was really good at restricting and doing all kinds of cool stuff. And so I originally created a tool um, called Cred King a while back, which did something very similar, but it used AWS Lambda. And the problem with Lambda is you could only deploy Lambda functions in AWS within like a certain number of regions. So you're limited to the number of pool of IP addresses. So you might get eight or 10 IP addresses, but that's your, that's your limit. Um, AWS Gateway API happened to rotate every single request with a different IP address. And so it's super easy. You could do like a million million requests in, for like pennies, less than pennies. And so uh, it just makes it super cost effective. Um, and that's ultimately why I built the tool was just to be able to rotate IP addresses in my web requests. Yeah. And, and the reason why I asked is because whenever I play backdoors and breaches with people and, you know, I give them a scenario that they had 1700 password fails within an hour and a half period. Uh, one of the first things that the team normally does is like, well, did they all come from the same IP address? And I'm like, no, they did not. And at that point, they're like, oh, son of a gun. Oh, okay. What do we do? All right. Uh, so that's why I like to point out that fire process exists because once you know it exists and it like starts to change your IR process of like, oh, wait, oh, that's, oh, okay. Yeah. So the way that I, so I would respond to that if I was a, de a defender and the way that I would handle this is I would look for um, the, the AWS API request always has a header for the Amazon API gateway. There's an API ID and it's a unique ID for each of the requests that pass through that. Now, obviously there's ways to get around that by running multiple, um, multiple API gateway proxies, uh, but it would be the same request. So if you noticed like um, on my screen here, I'll share it again real quick. If I can He's share screens, Ryan, Ryan's going to share screens. Uh, okay. Sorry. It's coming. There yeah. it is. There it is. Right. Good job, there. Ryan. Good job. Yes. Nice. So if you noticed, um, these requests, the K five zero use, whatever, it's the same on all of these. I'm highlighting them, but they're all the same. All the requests are the same API ID. Now, the reason why that's important is if you, you see a bunch of failed logins and different IP addresses, but if you could create custom detection for the API ID, if it's present and see if that API ID is the same, then there's a really good chance that you can catch the password spraying using the API gateway. Like now, once again, I could rotate that by just creating an, like a hundred different API gateways, but it's another step in that direction, I would say. So I don't know if that helps, but yeah. Uh, for the people commenting that I've learned a lot, uh, really what I do is I play backdoors and breaches with people and then I just ask <laughs> a lot of questions. And as I ask the questions, I was like, well, why do you think that you know would fail? Then I just listen to their answer. Why would you think this would succeed? And then I listen to their answer. And I've just learned uh, cybersecurity by just playing backdoors and breaches all the time. All right. All right, Mike, you got anything else for us before we talk about the class that you have and then uh, tell people that we are currently sponsored by... Black Hills Information Security and anti-siphon training. Uh, I guess I guess I already said it. Uh, I don't need to say it again. <laughs> yeah, you so, could say it again. I could. Mike, tell Not. us about the class that you teach, real quick. Uh, so it's an introduction to pen testing. Um, it's for people that are not used to pen testing, don't have experience pen testing, that would like to get in. Any sort of technical uh, background is great. You could be a defender. That's great. If you have any pen testing experience, it's not the class for you. Um, so I'm really tailoring it specifically for people that are trying to jump into offensive security from either another IT trade. Um, so software developers, system admins, database admins, network engineers, um, heck, help desk, IT support, any of those um, are the main targets of that. And we walk through a methodology for executing pen tests. So all of the normal pen testing phases you would experience um, everything from passive recon, active recon, vuln discovery, web, you know, uh, some of the web app stuff, um, external internals, hands-on, you know, that's pretty much it. So we're looking for that. Um, we also step through um, 
a bunch of pen testing tools and resources, but we also give you the experience of like actually doing the engagement. So that means writing a report and, um, and understanding the, the business processes kind of around pen testing. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much the nature of it, man. I was just thinking about how the uh, report writing part of the class, it's like, it's weird. Where'd all the students go? Yeah, it's uh, super boring, super boring. But you know what? If you're looking mm -hmm. to get in pen testing, it's the necessary evil. Oh, for it sure. I mean, absolutely is. And it's actually it's, what you leave behind too, right? Yeah. So. It's what the client pays for. Uh, I mean, they paid for the, the testing and everything, but the report's what they paid for. All right, Mike, thank you so much. Ryan, thanks for making sure that we uh, we looked good today. I, Mike, you know, your internet was fine. It was fine. It's cool. fine. It's fine. <laughs> uh, and it was nice that three Florida men could get together and share our knowledge of information security. Mainly you, Mike. Uh, mainly you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It it was mainly you, Ryan. No. It's I just mainly. was here. I know. I know. You did a great job, Ryan. <laughs> All right, Mike. <laughs> hey, thanks for joining us. This is your first time doing it. Hopefully, you'll join us for more of these. Uh, we do them every Tuesday and Wednesday afternoon at 4.30. We go live, and then the recordings are always available. So thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Ryan, kill it with fire. Kill it.